first one with uh, Sinvastatin, which had a dramatic effect on cardiovascular results. And uh, so this is very similar now with really good drugs for diabetes. Uh, the next section we have, and I'd ask them to come up here, please, the antimicrobial group. New generations of antimicrobials. Welcome. <laughs> Please come in. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. The group is assembling. Um, but let me just say uh, what, what they're going to take on is not the, is, uh, new antimicrobials and looking at policy and uh, possibly new business models. And it's very clear that we had, I guess the most exciting new thing that happened in medicine was the discovery of penicillin, which was a long time ago. But it seemed to be able to do everything. And for a while, people were so excited trying to make enough and get it, get it onto the market, uh, which didn't happen until the, uh, I guess, almost in the 1940s. And, and uh, that then caused an explosion in studies of new drugs that were antimicrobials because uh, penicillin did not do everything. And, and uh, the field of antimicrobials was dramatic with the introduction of one new class after another. And so the uh, infectious diseases, the antimicrobial approach, uh, became one of the most exciting areas of biomedical research. And that, that started to taper uh, a number of years ago. And now with resistance occurring, um, uh, one looks around and there's damn little work going on in the discovery of new antimicrobials. And it's a real problem. And so this approach that we're going to be hearing about the discussion today is speaking to that. And, and it's critical for healthcare in, in the world. And so leading that will be Joel Marcus and, and uh, I should say moderating Joel Marcus and uh, Lynn uh, Zadowski. Joel is the uh, founder of the Alexandria Real Estate uh, uh, Group. And, and uh, also he leads it, of course and uh, Alexandria real estate and, and uh, everything uh, associated with that. And, uh, but he and Lynn Zadowski are co-founders of the Alexandria Summit as well. And, and Lynn's work also is separate from that is her own consulting business, which, which uh, looks to all parts of starting companies and, and advising them. And Lynn is a research scientist at the start so should we put, bring together a scientist uh, along with a business person, and they've been doing a great job, and they're going to lead this next panel. Uh, Joel and Lynn, thank you for being here. Yeah, sure. So good morning, and uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, thank you, uh, Roy, for uh, your vision here, and to the pre Galian for um, <laughs> putting on this uh, great forum and event. And uh, I think Roy's vision and uh, help over the last couple of years has really transformed this into a, an amazing um, uh, set of uh, panels and uh, people who've come together to really explore a number of critical issues. Uh, I want to also welcome you to our center. Those of you who've been here uh, know it well. Those of you who haven't, uh, this was a contaminated laundry site about 10 years ago. and. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be selected by Mayor Bloomberg to transform it into what we consider to be a world-class science park in the city where you have academics, uh, you have commercial um, companies from big to small all operating here and a number of venture capital uh, components here as well. Um, this particular topic came out of a, uh, as Roy alluded to, uh, came out of a summit that the Alexandria Summit actually uh, put together earlier in this year where we brought together 
critical opinion leaders from government, from um, ac the academic world, the commercial world, um, thought leaders, um, to really explore some of the most important elements of the whole world of anti-infection or anti-infective uh, issues and to try to explore what were the most important of those issues that we could examine and develop a game plan to take forward. And so we're going to explore some of those this morning, really as an outgrowth of the, uh, of the summit, um, to look at the big challenges in the anti-infective area, how we may be able to increase funding. As Roy said, there is uh, really a dearth of attention and also to uh, spur innovation in this critical area. And you're in for a treat. We really have some of the most important figures in this, uh, in this area today to uh, help uh, explore um, and uh, try to um, really tee up the, uh, the issues and uh, where we can take this. And so first, my uh, co-moderator, as uh, Roy introduced, Lynn Zadowski, is a president and co-founder with me uh, of the Alexandria Summit. She serves as uh, chief science advisor to Alexandria uh, and has a, a storied career. She's a um, uh, hails from um, uh, uh, Illinois, but uh, got her PhD at Ohio State and uh, is um, very involved, has been very involved over many years in starting companies, both on the West Coast and here on the East Coast, and uh, really represents one of the most uh, important thought leaders uh, in this area. Um, and we're happy to have Lynn. Uh, immediately to Lynn's right is uh, Maria Ferrer. Many of you know Maria. Uh, she has a PhD, but more importantly, uh, she's one of the real pioneers in this area. She's now president and executive director of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. And uh, she has um, really been a great leader there and developed a great portfolio of innovative research and clinical programs that advance biomedical science. Uh, prior to that, she was the president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. And uh, prior to that, she served as president and chief executive officer of the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, and so she knows an awful lot about this area and has managed to be on both sides of both the commercial side and the uh, academic and even the government side. And earlier in car her career, she directed the Office of Tech Transfer of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, sitting next to her, um, we're really pleased to have Mike Bonney, who represents, I think, one of the true uh, leader thought leaders in this area. Mike is retired. CEO of uh, Cubis Pharmaceutical, which got bought by Merck. He's also on the, an advisor to the UK Review on anti Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, Mike really took um, Cubis from a uh, kind of a struggling startup to a uh, rather uh, significant leader in, the, uh, in this area and ultimately was acquired by Merck. Smart move on their part. He was uh, involved, in, was a VP of sales and marketing at Biogen before that, and previous to that worked at uh, Zeneca Pharmaceutical. He now chairs a number of boards, including Al Nylum, Bates College, sits on the board of Celgene, the global blood therapeutics company, um, and a number of other important um, institutes, also the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. So next to Mike is uh, Jonathan Leff. Uh, Jonathan's going to represent both uh, the investment point of view and some great insights into uh, the area of funding. Jonathan is partner of Deerfield, um, where he focuses on venture capital and structured investments in biotech and pharmaceuticals. Pr prior to that, he had a storied career at Warburg Pincus. He's also on the exec committee of the NVCA, the National Venture Capital Association, many other things. but. Um, uh, Jonathan is a, a great addition to our team. And last but not least, on the far left, but probably in the center of the road on all things, <laughs> and uh, Mark is going to team up, I think, with Roy a little later, is uh, Mark McClellan, known to most of us, has a storied career in government and in thought leadership. He's now director of the uh, Duke uh, Center, the Robert uh, J. Margolis Center for Health Policy, and uh, is a pr the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business uh, Medicine and Health Policy down at Duke. Uh, I'm a huge Duke fan, so it's great to have Mark here. Um, the new center supports and conducts research, evaluation, and implementation on educational activities to improve health policy and health through collaboration across 
the Duke Health System and between public and private sectors. And as many of you know, Mark is both a doctor and an economist. He was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute before coming to uh, Duke. And before that, he was a former administrator of uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, better known as CMS, and former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and really pioneered uh, some of the most important uh, developments um, in health reform. So we really have an all-star panel. I'm going to ask Mar um, uh, Lynn to really set the stage um, for the panel discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Joel. I am going to make a few comments to just set up the discussion today and um, just emphasize that we want this to be a very interactive discussion, so we'll have a lot of discussion between the panelists, and then near the end we'll go out to take questions from the audience. So today we're going to discuss the critical issues impacting the development of new anti-infectives and the initi initiatives needed to improve innovation in this field. So, as many of you know for years, public health experts have warned it's only a matter of time before we face a superbug. And in May this year, in the United States, in Pennsylvania, they discovered a strain of E. coli that was resistant to colistin. So the threat of superbugs has become a reality. The rise in AMR, antimicrobial resistance, over the past decade has become one of the world's most pressing health issues. Infectious diseases represent three of the top ten causes of death globally, and 25 percent of all deaths worldwide. Each year, millions of patients acquire serious and life-threatening infections, and over the next 35 years, it's estimated that 300 million people are expected to die prematurely due to growing drug resistance. Antibiotic resistance in the U.S. alone costs an estimated $20 billion a year in excess health care costs and represents more than 8 million additional days that people spend in the hospital. And by 2050, it's estimated that drug-resistant infections could kill an additional 10 million people a year worldwide at the cost of $100 trillion in lost output. That's greater than the size of the existing world economy. But despite all this urgency of the threat, it's been more than 30 years since we've had or developed a novel class of antibiotics capable of fighting these drug-resistant bacteria. AMR is a global issue. It's rising to the top of our political agenda. In 2016, in January, we saw a declaration that was signed by 80 biopharmaceutical companies and diagnostic companies on combating antimicrobial resistance. In July, the AMR review, which was commissioned by the UK in 2014, issued its final report. And in September this year, the UN signed a declaration on AMR where world leaders made a commitment to fight the rise of drug-resistant pathogens and to ensure the continued access to life-saving antibiotics. As we know, policy is a critical element to advancing this field and something that we'll discuss today. This is a very important year in terms of the presidential election, existing pending health care policy, as well as the renewal of the DUFA 6 in 2017. Many of you last year participated in a bipartisan effort, the 21st Century Cures, which was passed in July of 2015. That House bill supported legislation for developing new drugs to treat AMR, and it builds off progress, which we'll discuss today, made with the GAIN Act, which was passed in PDUFA 5, by creating economic incentives and new regulatory pathways, helping to make it more feasible scientifically and economically to develop new antibiotics that address unmet medical needs. In the Senate, its counterpart was passed by the HELP Committee uh, in April, but it has been passed by the entire Senate, and today we'll discuss where that stands in terms of becoming legislation. So while there is no simple solution, there are things we can do to encourage and support innovation. And with the distinguished panel today, representing this diverse set of perspectives, we'll discuss what's needed in terms of policy and incentives to create sustainable market model with transformational commercial models that will enhance conservation that will improve financial and access-related predictability, and that will support the global coordination and commitment needed. So with that, I'd like to start with Maria. And Maria, you've spent your career in this field. 
And as Joel mentioned, you were at one time the CEO of the Global TB Alliance. Most recently, you served on the United Nations high-level panel on access to medicines. Uh, many of you may have seen in October, there was an article in the New York Times. It talked about the scale of the TB problem in India with 2.5 million new cases in 2015. TB being a bacteria that mutates quickly into drug-resistant forms. So I thought it would be good to start with you to put this in the context of a global perspective, the urgency of developing strategies to, um, to treat and to address AMR. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. I see a lot of uh, friendly faces, which is always good to have in the audience. This is a tough topic, and let's start with a very basic definition. So antimicrobial resistance happens when bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi are no longer destroyed by the drugs that once could do so. So we have now a dearth of drugs that allow us to kill these pathogens. The problem is that AMR is man-made. So going back, it's entirely man-made, whether it's medical or agricultural use or misuse of antibiotics. And therefore, it's something that, that uh, we are responsible for and we're responsible to fix. Um, I want to go back to your stats, Lynn, of the uh, TB uh, problem. To just give you a sense of perspective, um, this is something that I worked for many years in my life. There are 2 billion people in the world infected with tuberculosis. That's a third of the world. We carry the tuberculosis bacillus. 9.6 million people a year get sick. A million of those are children. 1.5 million people die every year of tuberculosis. That's about 3,800, 4,000 people a day. Now, of those people, we have 480,000 that have drug-resistant tuberculosis, which means in multidrug-resistant tuberculosis that you're resistant to two class of drugs. For tuberculosis, you need to be treated with four drugs in a cocktail. And it takes between six months to two years, depending. So it's a long, long fall. Out of those 480,000, 10% have extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, which means you have resistance to the four key groups of drugs. That's essentially 40,000 people that are walking around with a death sentence. There's nothing we can do for them. And to be really, really um, worried. Of those 40,000 people, only one in every three, in every four get treated. So 75% of the people that carry extensive drug-resistant tuberculosis are not being treated right now. And an XDRTB has been found in 100 countries around the world. So it's not a problem of the Global South, it is a problem of the globe. Now, why do we need a concerted effort? Well, this is not only a public health emergency. People have said, and I agree, that this is really a security emergency. So it's a national security emergency. It's a global emergency. And why do we need a concerted effort? Well, I will put to you that there are six reasons why we need a concerted global effort on this. Number one, safety. I think we don't need to belabor that point. We need to reduce the risk. Number two, governance. Who does what, when? Is it a WHO issue? Is it a national government issue? Is it a UN issue? How do we tackle? Where, where do we go for leadership on this issue? Second, timeliness. Well, third, timeliness. When you have this kind of an outbreak, you need to control it. You need to make sure that it doesn't um, uh, move beyond the borders. Scientific foundation. We need to have diagnostics. We need to have drugs. We need to have interventions that allow us to control it. And the panel, I think, will focus on that today. Coordination. We need to unify the response. There is enormous amount of stigma associated with these diseases. We panic. We close borders. We, we make sure people don't get into airplanes. It has an economic impact that's enormous 
for the world. Lynn just mentioned some of that. And without a unified response from people in the field that are able to identify an outbreak and that are able to allow us to handle it and to know what it is, we have uh, the, the, we don't contain the, the problem. And finally, we need to learn lessons. We keep relearning lessons and we need to finally figure out how to get all these lessons put together. So a global partnership that allows us to capture all of these lessons to allow us to move the antibiotic development further and to have the resources to do it is critically important. And maybe we'll just, I'd like to continue on with you, Mike. Um, you know, you've worked for many years in this industry. You were also an advisor to the UK AMR Review. And maybe talk a little bit more about AMR from outside the U.S. to inside the U.S. and, again, this, this need for this global commitment. Sure. Happy to do it and delighted to be here. This is a really critical issue, I believe, from a public health standpoint. Unless you think that AMR is only an issue with tuberculosis bacillus, it's not. The last year for which I have data in the U.S. is 2012, where 23,000 people died from bacterial infections for bugs, caused by bugs that in the 20 years ago we could treat without concern. Um, if you extrapolate, that's roughly a half a million people around the world currently are dying beyond TB from bacteria that just 20 years ago we considered to be highly treatable. So recognizing this problem, uh, the G20 tasked Prime Minister Cameron at the time in 2014 with putting together a series of recommendations to present to the G20 um, in 2016. This was headed up by Jim O'Neill, and they produced a series of reports and then their final conclusions uh, earlier this year. Um, and as Maria has said, this really is a global problem. This Colliston bug that she mentioned in May was isolated in the U.S. It had a, a, a gene that conferred resistance in an E. coli to colistin, which is really the drug of last resort for this type of bacterial infection, it was first identified about eight weeks before in China. So these bacteria are flying all over the world with us. Um, I don't think they have a preferred a frequent flyer number. I don't think they prefer one airline over another. They just hop aboard whatever's available. <laughs> Um, and we do need coordinated efforts. So the series of recommendations that AMR came up with, I would put into a couple of buckets. One, public awareness, both to provide the foundational support for the policy prescriptions that will need to be developed to increase investment in this area, and second, to relieve the pressure from consumers on physicians for the inappropriate use of antibiotics, which drives more resistance. The second, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, is how do we preserve the effectiveness or at least partial effectiveness of the antibiotics that we have today? And there they called for a series of act actions. One is um, global surveillance so that we can identify and track emergent resistance more clearly around the globe. Uh, two, investment in diagnostics, a very high percentage of infections that are treated in the developed world today physician never knows what bug they're treating. It's very difficult to get a culture uh, if, the back, if the infection is outside of the bloodstream or the urine or on the skin. Uh, and it's not routine in clinical practice to know, so we have to use very broad spectrum antibiotics, which increases the pressure on the biome to mutate and develop resistance. They also called for the reduction in use of antibiotics as growth promoters in industrial farming. Um, the only country that we could find data for that's reasonably reliable is the U.S., but something on the order of 70 percent of the tonnage, and it is tons, of antibiotics that are consumed in the U.S. each year are used for growth promoters. If you change the biome of an animal by putting antibiotics in their feed, they gain weight faster, and as a result, they get to market more quickly. Um, the second part of the overuse, of course, are, is human use, when often antibiotics are, are required or requested by a patient for what is likely a viral infection and for which there's no efficacy. So we're, we're putting more antibiotic into the universe, uh, into the world, with no discernible benefit in those circumstances, and hence shortening the effective life of the antibiotic. 
And the fourth, or the third area, I guess I would say, is incentives to stimulate investment in this area. And what the Commission called for were the creation of two international funds, one of a couple of billion dollars to support early stage research, and the second was a $40 billion international fund to award a prize for, for, for those folks who develop important new antibacterials that have activity against some of these emerging superbugs. Um, that prize would be, uh, the recommendation was that prize would be in the order of a, mil, a billion to a billion seven, and is driven by a theory that is relatively unique to antimicrobials in the medical world, which is we need to de-link the economic return for this innovation from the utilization of the innovation. Because antibacterials, antimicrobials, the more they're used, the less value they have to society because you've increased the likelihood in a non-predictable way that resistance will be either selected or developed. And of course, bacteria can share these mechanisms of resistance from one species to another. So it's a creative way, uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss uh, alternatives to this, but it's a creative way to try and provide incentives for capital to flow into this area, which has been neglected for probably the last 20 or 25 years, with, and decoupling those incentives from driving volume when you get a new antibiotic approved. So let me stop there. And we can... Yes, yeah, so, so I guess if you take up what uh, Roy mentioned in his introduction that there are maybe, I forgot the exact wording, but maybe damn few uh, new um, antibiotics. One of the things, Mike, you just mentioned and hit upon is obviously the investment from the commercial sector. You uh, ran Cubis for many years, and maybe it'd be useful how you guys looked at it and thought about this, you know, the investment in this area. Obviously, Merck came and bought the company, but where we are today on the investment side and what we need to do to overcome some of the commercial issues. Well, I think our, first I would say that I think our success at Cubist was really a reflection of the failure of policy in this area. Our lead drug was the last um, new class of antibiotic discovered and, and made available for human use, and it had very potent activity against um, Staph aureus and particularly methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. At the time I joined the company, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus represented about 60% of all staff isolated in hospitals in developed countries around the world. And the standard of care was a 40-year-old drug, actually 50-year-old drug. It was approved the year I was born. I, I was much younger when I started at Cuba. Um, and, and that drug was clearly losing its effectiveness, and so there was great concern about it. So that's one model that society can take if, if we can maintain a modest infrastructure and just wait for thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to die because the resistant clone has become so common now that there's a real market, you can do that. The way we thought about it was we worked very hard to say what's the appropriate use, in what circumstance should you use this product versus the historic product trying to retain the efficacy of this new product for as long as possible. And as we looked at developing our pipeline, we looked at emerging resistance, and it is incredibly risky, but what we ultimately did was decide to invest in areas where new mechanisms of resistance were, res were emerging, hoping that they would become common enough over the period of time it took us to move from the, cl from the bench to the bedside so that we could make the commercial case and provide a reasonable return for the investors. Um, but it was an act of faith. We tried many w times in many different ways to try and predict based on incidents, et cetera, what would become a common mechanism of resistance. And we, the time hasn't passed, quite frankly, yet to determine whether we were accurate or not. But we, we always had big error bars around that. Yeah, so Mark, maybe uh, picking up with uh, some of the uh, concepts, the so-called delinking issues of um, exclusivity, which has become kind of a dirty word in Washington these days of sorts. How do you think about, from the governmental perspective, how can we incentivize 
this effort um, if there isn't really the commercial uptake on it, as Mike said, in, in a, such a, in a dramatic way as there is in obviously cancer today in neuroscience, etc. Yeah, n no question. First of all, there has been a significant decline in the investment in antimicrobials over the last several decades with fewer drugs in development, fewer companies working on it, um, Mike's efforts notwithstanding, and fewer new antibiotics making it to market and this growing problem of resistance that you've already heard about. Um, you know, the issue of unmet medical needs is something that we see in lots and lots of areas of, uh, of health and health care. But there are some things that make antimicrobials and, and particularly um, antibacterials for resistant uh, bacteria. Bacteria and, and especially gram-negative bacteria, um, particularly uh, unique. And I want to just highlight a couple of those that pick up on some of the themes that we've talked about and why uh, this is becoming and why there is so much uh, uh, global attention uh, uh, to this issue among, uh, among many leading policymakers. Um, if you think about um, different areas of drug development, many of them are challenging. Um, uh, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, and unfortunately, antimicrobials is, is one of those, too, for some of the reasons that we've talked about. But on top of that uh, barrier to um, uh, an uncertainty with uh, investment, uh, there's some real challenges with paying for the drugs once they're on the market. And if you think about what makes antimicrobials uh, kind of different in this regard, um, one is that the main benefits of having these drugs available are not to the people who are being treated, important as that is to treat resistant infections, but it's to everybody else who as a result of treating the infectious disease early doesn't get infective. We're talking about infections here, not about chronic diseases that um, matter a lot to the individual and their family involved, these, if they're not contained, can have much bigger effects on the rest of society. And you heard from Maria earlier about some of the projections that exist of how many more people could be affected if we don't take action soon to address this problem. And second, we have a model of, of paying for drugs that's worked uh, reasonably well for getting a number of cures and better treatments to the market, which is you pay for the drug when you use it. Um, but the problem with antimicrobials, as you've already heard, is that you really want to discourage you. So think about the way that we've set up incentives for uh, developing and bringing these treatments to market. So it's kind of set in a way that's exactly opposite uh, to, to what we want. So we, uh, we, it's only usable in a, a small number of patients because and only gets paid for in a small number of patients patients, not the broader uh, part of society that benefits from having the treatments available. And second, it's pay, the, the payments are on a volume basis so that uh, the encour they're encouraged in order to get the, the investment recapped, uh, you're encouraging overuse. So that's where um, the term delinkage comes from. I don't think it's been a, uh, become a bad word. I think it's, um, you know, the, the concerns here are probably about um, the challenge of getting that $4 billion fund that Mike 40. mentioned. $40 billion fund, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's uh, several billion for each drug. A lot. But that $40 billion fund funded. And uh, so far, uh, there's some, you know, some, a lot of interest, uh, high-level attention for in, uh, from the European Union and IMI, Welcome Trust, uh, other global uh, activities, a lot of reports out there. This is part of the Davos uh, 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 ministerial and, and, uh, and uh, uh, um, industry uh, commitments. Lots of, uh, lots of talk and lots of recognition. This is important, but it hasn't really happened yet. And I think for uh, the, the sake of moving these efforts forward, we're going to have to find ways to, uh, to try to bring down that total, that total cost. And some of the ideas that, that we're working on at uh, Duke Margolis, and we have a conference coming up on this topic where I think some of you are uh, in, involved in just a couple of weeks in Washington are, are ways of not just replacing all of the the private investment and private spending that goes into antimicrobials, but, but leveraging it. So instead of trying to raise a full $40 billion fund, uh, can we aim for a, a lower, perhaps more feasible target than that, but one that reinforces uh, some of the private investments that's occurring? For example, uh, would it be possible to, to link this uh, market reward for producing uh, effective antimicrobial to the adoption of new payment models for it, payment models that are based not on uh, how many times the drug is used, but maybe something like we're seeing in other areas of healthcare payment reform now. I 
uh, maybe a, uh, a per person per month uh, payment that an insurance company would make to have the drug available uh, and to uh, uh, that would go up not when the drug is used more but when uh, resistance continues when there's evidence that the, the drug is being used to contain uh, an, uh, uh, a resistant organism so this may seem, may seem pretty different but if you think about where a lot of healthcare financing is headed now and this I think has broader implications for the pharmaceutical industry too, we're moving away from volume-based payments and pretty much everything except drugs now, uh, away from volume-based payments for, for primary care physicians, for hospitals, for so-called accountable care organizations. And if there is an area in pharmaceuticals where you need this kind of shift, this is it. And so I think that the, the, instead of viewing this as just something that, that the public sector needs to do by itself, raising very large amounts of money, finding ways to link up uh, public sector activity with reforming how the private markets work and private sector financing for uh, antimicrobials could be a much more promising approach. So let me take the next step, maybe moving back to the, um, to the early stage. Jonathan, uh, I come to you, I'm a young Mike Bonney, and I have this idea to attack uh, a number of um, anti-infective areas that Maria and Lynn have uh, articulated, huge markets. Um, I'm pretty, maybe not me, but the, the person that comes to you is very smart, very uh, insightful and articulate in this area, and uh, maybe has a chance to get some leverage with some, uh, um, some non-dilutive funding. Are you even interested in taking a meeting, and what do you do? Well, uh, history would show that if you're a, a young Mike Bonney, you, you do get interest from venture capitalists, and you do get funding, and you do bring important drugs to, to the market. Uh, but very few others have been successful in doing that. It's the exception, not the rule, in the area of anti-infectives uh, and in antibiotics. So uh, maybe first uh, just a word about the importance of that whole proposition of raising venture capital. You know, uh, if you think about how we can have a thriving ecosystem of bringing new antibiotics to the marketplace that, that treat emerging infections, it starts, of course, with scientific research and coming up with, with uh, knowledge about new mechanisms to be able to attack these new bugs in, in different ways. But then translating that from the scientific laboratory into a drug and getting it to market is where big dollars come into play. So uh, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the statistics uh, and the various studies suggesting that the cost of developing a drug is a billion and a half dollars or two billion dollars, depending on what study you look at and how you do the math. But the numbers are very large. The probability of success is low. Something like 10 percent of all drugs that enter clinical trials are actually ever successful. Uh, and, and so where does that billion plus dollars come from? Well, at the end of the day, it almost always comes from venture capitalists, the financial markets, and biopharmaceutical companies. Those are the sources for, for the, the big dollars to develop drugs. And typically, for most drugs, it's a combination of those sources that contribute to getting drugs all the way to the marketplace. So the issues around public policy that affect the economic equation that uh, people look at when they're deciding whether to invest in new drug development or in something entirely different and then if they're going to invest in new drug development, whether it's going to be in cancer drugs or gene therapy or, or neurology or, or anti-infectives, that equation is impacted by public policy in very significant ways. At the end of the day, uh, the, the life of a venture capitalist is fairly simple in some respects, which is you, you, you look at how much it's going to cost to develop something what, the, what you think the probability of being successful in doing that is going to be, how long it's going to take, and then what is the economic value of that thing if you're successful enough to have developed it, and you put all that into a relatively straightforward economic model, and you're going to invest your dollars where the returns look best, and you're not going to invest in those areas where the returns don't look good. So the challenge, so of course, that, that's the simple version of it. A whole lot of texture goes into trying to figure out what assumptions to make about all those things. But the, the fundamental challenge for antibiotics has been the way that economic model looks. And it really goes back to a lot of the things that have been said already on this panel. I mean, the, the challenges and the costs of developing 
a drug for antibiotics are of the same nature as other areas of drug development, although there are some unique ones, which we can come back to and talk about. But the challenges are, are similar if you look at the commercial value of a new antibiotic, in many ways, it's looked at as much lower than an equally innovative drug for many other kinds of medical needs. And the reason for that is the things that have been talked about here, uh, that the best new antibiotics and the most important new antibiotics are the ones that you don't want to use, and you want to keep them on the, the shelf until they're absolutely needed. And when they're absolutely needed, hopefully that's, that's rare, but those drugs, so those drugs end up being worth relatively little to the people who develop them. So, so maybe one question for Maria, and you've been there and done it. Is this better done in a startup nonprofit rather than a venture-backed nonprofit? Well, I think, frankly, <laughs> I want all of them to do it. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, you can't do it. Uh, alone. When, when we were developing the TB drugs, and now there's a, a real pipeline there, we found that it was absolutely critical to have the partners in, in the private sector as well as the public sector. And I do think that there's a place for, for venture investing in this. I mean, as difficult as drugs are, and, and they are very difficult, I've got to tell you, one of the biggest problems is diagnostics. One of the, one of the key issues here is that, as, as was said before, you're treating a viral infection with a medicine for bacteria because people want to feel they're doing something about it. And if we don't have point-of-care diagnostics that are sophisticated, that can be taken to the field, and that we can actually pinpoint what the problem is so we can use the right drug for it, it's a problem. So as difficult as it is, so Joel, I'm not taking your bait. I think all of the above, uh, right. we, we need a, a global movement here. And it's not only for, for drugs. I think diagnostics is critically important. If I could just elucidate one point, Joel, that I think gets to part of the challenge, because I've been in a venture capital role for a while, and I've, I've also been advising a whole host of early stage antibacterial companies about how to get funding. Um, while it is absolutely true what Mark said about this being a unit-driven pricing model, the vast majority of resistant bacteria show up first, at least in the developed world, in hospitals. And the hospital payment system around the world, true in the U.S., true in, in most developed countries, is a capitated payment system. So if you show up with a serious pneumonia, you, that gets coded, and you get, as the provider, as the hospital, you get paid X. And the drugs are subsumed within that X. And so the, the fact of the matter is it's very difficult to introduce innovation, which might have a higher price, even in the rare instance that you would have a resistant clone that you needed to treat this patient with, into that model because there's no room for the hospital to actually get reimbursed for the higher price drug. The, the DRG, the payment model, is built on the generic drug that's been used for the last 20 years. So it, it really creates some disincentives when you're doing the calculation that, um, uh, that Jonathan suggested here it gets very difficult, and this is where we run into problems all the time with these companies I'm advising, is they'll get the, the source of capital, get through the diligence on the technology and say, interesting, this might be worth investing in, and then they'll say, okay, what's our exit? Who will pay for this thing? Will anybody buy the company? And the answer to that almost universally now is no. There's, nobody's going to pay for it, and if nobody will pay for it, nobody will buy it, so it's not consistent with my job trying to re generate a return for my LPs to invest in this one when I could invest someplace else, cancer, rare diseases, metabolic diseases, where reimbursement is more assured. If I could just add a couple of points on to that, uh, this, this, this uh, challenge in the, of the patients who are most likely to benefit from the, the new um, high-priority antimicrobials being very sick patients who are in hospitals and are paid under you know, fixed DRG payments has been recognized, and there are proposals out there like the so-called, I think it's the Disarm Act that would 
automatically add on some payment. Uh, at least there's one antibiotic that made it through a process to get an add-on payment from Medicare. But but it is it is a pretty uncertain approach. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, a better approach might be for Medicare to have just a you know, per member per month uh, payment that goes to the uh, the drug manufacturer so that when the drug is needed, it can be made available. And, and you know, I guess back to the, the delinkage point. This is one, one other um, point about uh, incentives for especially the early stage startup companies. You know, we've been talking a lot about what are so-called pull incentives. You know, you, don't, you develop an antibiotic that really works and you get new kinds of payment, not just the, um, you know, the inadequate payments that, that aren't working uh, uh, today based on, on volume and, and DRGs. Um, in, instead of that, or in addition to that, there also are a number of proposals that are intended to make it easier for the early stage companies. So funding from BARDA, you know, the same uh, um, federal agency that exactly supports right. uh, uh, bioterrorism agents and others where there isn't uh, you know, a, a clear good market for meeting early stage uh, development milestones, assistance with the uh, FDA review process or the, the, the GAIN Act, you know, priority review, extra attention, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, so there really is a, a comprehensive set of um, uh, supports and incentives that are needed, and um, unfortunately, we're not we're not there yet. And maybe I want to segue now over to policy because um, you know that's such an important part of this. And I know, Mike, you know we've talked a little bit about the Gain Act that you were one of the the founders of the Gain Act. So I, I want to mention that. I also want to talk a little bit about the new legislation that's pending, so legislation that was passed in the House in 21st Century Cures that then went to the Senate. It was taken up by Senators uh, Bennett and Hatch. And here we are in this time of urgency, and we're seeing these Calistin resistance strains. And they got their part of the bill passed by the Help Committee, but then it got caught into the markups and it never went to the floor. And I think really just to talk a little bit about where it is in the process, but how impactful these pieces of legislation can be as incentives for the development and discovery of new antibiotics. So maybe start with you, Mike, talking about gain, and then we'll go to, to you, Mark, and, and maybe reflect a little bit on the process and where it is today. Sure. So GAIN, uh, as, as Lynn has said, was passed as a rider on the uh, PDUFA, the last PDUFA legislation uh, five years ago, four and a half years ago, that funds the FDA. And basically what it did was it defined a series of bacteria that are particularly problematic where resistance is developing, so-called so QIDPs, Qualified Infectious Disease and if you have something that works against them, you have a QIDP, which is a qualified infectious disease product. For that, it, it, uh, it encourages the FDA to d work with the company to define a quick path to market that's safe for patients. And it also provides relief from a, a clause of the Hatch-Waxman uh, Act that was passed in 1984 that was designed to encourage generic competition. So what happens with a new chemical entity today, or pre-gain, for any new chemical entity, four years after your first approval, there are incentives in place for generic companies to challenge those patents. Um, and if they're successful, a generic enters the market, et cetera. What gain does is for a QIDP is it doesn't allow for that four year in and a filing. So it gives the innovator a slightly longer period of time. And our theory here was that we wanted to, um, we didn't come up with delinkage at Cubist, but we did want to relieve the pressure that you have as a commercial entity to accelerate revenue inappropriately. And so by extending, by, by protecting, if you will, a new, important new antibiotic, from this early generic entry, it relieves some of that pressure to get the return for the hundreds of millions of dollars um, that it costs to get the drug to market. Um, it did provide a little bit of a bolus when it was passed. Um, venture firms did fund a series of new companies with some new technologies. It was still a very small percentage of the total, but I think more than anything what it did was it, it gave 
folks like me and folks, microbiologists, infectious disease docs who work in this space, some hope that the policymakers were getting that we had a problem here. I think, actually, that what Mark is proposing in terms of this PMPM is an elegant, elegant solution. Um, it's very, I think it'll be challenging to get it through, but it's probably more doable than the creation of a $40 billion prize fund administered by an international group of experts. And I do think, as I, as I project myself with a new technology trying to raise capital in the space, if I there's a lot of devil to be, devils to be worked out in the details here, but if I could go to the investor or the purveyor of capital and say, if this is successful, here's, we're pretty much guaranteed that we would get this kind of revenue, independent, and in fact what it does is the incentive now of the innovator is to decrease use because your margin's bigger the less drug that you use, which is completely aligned with how an antibiotic should be used anyway. You should only use appropriate use is right patient, right time, right dose, right drug and not before that, so. So I, I do want to interject here before Jonathan and Mark, and, and this is, um, you know, we're talking about U.S.-centric legislation, but we clearly are. there is a great deal of movement uh, abroad. Certainly we, you've sp spoken about the U EU experience, but let's remember that drugs are very clever. The, the bugs are very clever, and so we, antibiotics, are going to have to be a consistent and eternal uh, enterprise. And I do think that we can't minimize the contributions that can and are being made by groups around the globe. It is an issue that affects all of them, and you have very clear um, science going on in, in places around the world. And so I just want to make sure that we're not totally U.S.-centric when we look at this. There's a lot of contributions. The, the big issue, of course, is once they're developed, how do you ensure access to where they're needed? So I just wanted to interject. And just to, to pick up on that, the, um, the approach that, that we were talking about, which I, I think is more of a, a U.S. piece of the solution where we tend not to have um, you know, some of the proposals that have, I think, significant traction in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world would actually have the, the, the government or a collection of governments buy out the, the patent rights for uh, a drug and then license it to, to be available with um, a kind of government oversight of how it's being used and so forth. Um, the challenge with that in the U.S. is that we tend not to get the government that much involved and also we tend to get more nervous about sort of the bigger numbers that, that you need if you're totally replacing the, the private market rather than trying to, uh, to to move it in the right direction. Uh, but I think that, you know, the, a, a program like what we were describing in the U.S. should be designed in a way that reinforces whatever the, the European or, or, or global solution is. We, we are all in this together, and uh, um, you know, no one country, I think, is going to be able to provide adequate uh, financial support, even the, even the United States. Um, but, but getting on to, to where we are today, uh, there, there are some other proposals, as uh, Lynn mentioned, that are under active consideration uh, in Congress, um, aside from you're going beyond what's in the GAIN Act, which I think might I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's been an important program. There are you know, 50, 60 drugs that have yep. qualified, uh, uh, I think seven or eight maybe, that have made it to, to, to the market, five. Yep. five. Um, but if you look at so the highest priority CDC, you know, global threats and, and what we're getting, we're just still not, not a lot. we're just not there yet. And the... Uh, the uh, legislation that Congress is considering now as part of 21st Century Cures includes some additional proposals. Not quite yet the, the approach that, uh, uh, that we've been talking about. Hopefully that will change. But things like um, a transferable exclusivity voucher. So this would be uh, instead of just extending the patent life when a uh, manufacturer produces an antimicrobial that, that really meets one of these high priority needs, uh, they get a voucher that they could sell or apply apply to another drug uh, that might be uh, one that has a, a multi-billion dollar market for, for longer uh, patent exclusivity. Um, and this has been a bit controversial. It does solve the problem of you know, not needing new government funding to, to support uh, uh, the development of antimicrobials, but this is a time 
as you all probably noticed, when there are a lot of concerns about uh, high drug prices, and, and basically this is a mechanism for, for financing um, greater access to or greater development of these antimicrobials through higher prices on other drugs. And that's kind of a tough uh, political sell, too. So, so the, there, there also are some ideas for building on the so-called um, push incentives, so early stage financial support and uh, technical assistance. And, and Joel, picking up on one thing that, that you had mentioned earlier around um, nonprofits or, or public-private partnerships, um, there's a report coming out, I think, next week uh, that um, the, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative and a number of other groups and experts, uh, um, uh, uh, micro, you know, micro, um, uh, another, a number of other antimicrobial experts have been involved with uh, on how to develop a network of clinical uh, sites for trials, which, uh, which, which seems like a good example of where partnerships could, could re pre-competitive partnerships could really work. Um, not only is it hard to identify and enroll patients in these trials, um, you, you need a large number of sites to manage, and doing that on kind of a one-off basis, uh, I think this report is going to demonstrate is much more expensive than it could be if there was something like a standard protocol or at least a, a well-established network of 80, 100 uh, hospitals or centers uh, working together uh, to enroll patients and bring down the cost of doing a trial by having uh, standard uh, pr procedures and the like. And, um, you know, another area where there's been some discussion about additional um, uh, incentives, uh, regulatory incentives or financial support is in the development of um, uh, uh, rapid diagnostics. So uh, Maria mentioned them in the, the context of uh, uh, patients who might have uh, viral versus bacterial illnesses. Um, they're also needed or would be very helpful for these sick patients who develop what looks like a, a bacterial or septic infection in the, in, in the hospital. But right now you have to wait for blood cultures two or three days, and these patients are sick enough that you need to treat with pretty broad-spectrum antibiotics. It's a challenge for drug development because you try to enroll patients in the trial, and it turns out a lot of them may not end up having the, uh, the um, particular um, microbe for which the new treatment is intended to uh, affect. So finding ways to, to improve the diagnostics there would be very helpful. And let me just mention one more potential source of uh, financing here. Um, we do spend a significant amount of money on treatments for infections, for, for uh, microbial infections in the U.S. Don't quote me on this number, but I think it's something like $12 billion or so per year. So not not, um, not just for drugs. Not just for drugs, but for, for treating that. infections. But we do spend uh, billions of dollars on um, antimicrobials where they are not needed. They're not indicating things like uh, um, uh, upper respiratory infections, ear infections. That's probably on the order of a couple of billion billion per year, uh, more than a billion. So if we could if we could retool, how, redirect how we're spending the money for antimicrobial treatments, that would go a long way, I think, towards uh, helping to address this problem and also helping to address the public concern that they just don't, is really can, worried about putting more and more money into healthcare these days. And uh, could I just touch on one additional public policy opportunity? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of financial incentives of different kinds to, to increase the perceived value of making these investments. One other uh, area that has, has been pursued and still actively being pursued in Congress is a regulatory innovation, and that's uh, variously been called by a bunch of different acronyms. People may have heard the LPAD, the PATH Act, the ADAPT Act, and, and it all comes to the same thing. LPAD stands for a limited population antibiotic development. The concept is basically to empower the FDA with additional flexibility to be able to approve antibiotics that treat very limited populations, meaning patients with very resistant infections that may be quite rare but may emerge to become more common in the future to enable the development of those drugs in a, uh, in a cost-effective and efficient manner and allow the labeling of those drugs and, and stewardship for those drugs to make sure that if they're only proven to work in a very limited uh, high-need set of patients, that they're actually only used in that very limited high-need set of patients until further studies document where else they can be useful. And just a you know, word about why this is so important. I mean, if somebody wanted to develop a drug to treat the colistin-resistant infections that, that Mike was talking about here, 
It's an incredibly difficult thing to do in a way that meets traditional FDA approval standards to do a double-blind randomized controlled trial of some kind in a patient population where cholestin-resistant infections fortunately remain very, very rare. Right. When they happen, they're devastating, and there's a great fear that they could begin to happen much, much more frequently. But if you want to enroll patients in that clinical trial today, you'd have a very, very difficult time enrolling more than <clears throat> a few. And so the idea is to enable efficient development for these kinds of populations that are going to become the major, uh, major unmet needs of the future. That particular legislation was actually included in the 21st Century Cures Act that was passed by the House of Representatives. Uh, it was discussed in great depth as part of the Senate innovation package, but didn't, uh, did not make it to the floor of the Senate, or has not yet made it to the floor of the Senate, but it's still a very active area of legislative effort and one that I think deserves our attention. And one that we hope will get passed in the, the lame duck session. So with that, um, I think it's would be good to open out for a few questions. And if someone has a question, if you could give your name and your affiliation. Yes. Uh, Jay Siegel, Dunstan, Dunstan. It's my understanding that in the vaccine space. It's my un Jay Siegel, Johnson and Johnson. It's my understanding that in the vaccine space, there's been some success of just guaranteed purchase programs where the a, a purchaser like a government body may guarantee to a developer that should you be successful in meeting these criteria, we will buy a certain amount, and that de-risks at least the commercial risks of building the factory and doing the trials. Is there a potential role for that in, in, in this uh, broader space of antimicrobial resistance? Yeah, I mean, it's not terribly dissimilar from the prize idea, really. Um, I think that, you know, in the there's some skepticism, I would say, within the capital markets about that. So the proof would need to be in the pudding. There would actually need to be a demonstration that the government would fall, fall through on that. There's a classic case in biotechnology where somebody put a lot of money into developing an antidote to bioterrorism and on the basis of a promise of purchase, and it never – Appropriations weren't there. The appropriations weren't there, and the company went bankrupt, and all the investors lost their money. So there's some skepticism in the capital markets, but it would work. It does delink. No. Um, it, it allows the government to stockpile what is a public good, provided the attributes of the product are sufficient that it can be stored for a long time. Yeah. You know, I would just say that that kind of approach is essential in certain areas like bioterrorism and <laughs> pandemic threats where there is no market today to treat anthrax, but there's a worry that somebody could use anthrax as a, as a weapon, and then you want to have those drugs available. Really, the only way that people are going to develop new drugs for those kinds of situations is if there's a, a guaranteed purchaser like the government at, at the other end of it. Now, I think you're also talking about can that model be expanded to capture other areas of the antibiotic challenge uh, other than, than bioterrorism, uh, and, I, and I think in principle it could. Right, and um, conceptually it, it's similar to the market entry rewards that we discussed, and if that's the only or main solution, probably on the same order of magnitude in, in terms of right. billions that, that you need to have a, a pretty firm commitment to, to uh, to make it work, and you know, I, I think there that the challenge is just you know, if, if we have forty billion dollars, great. But I would like to find a way to get there with less uh, public funding. So the advanced purchase commitments have worked, and one of the drivers of that have been, of course, the investments of groups like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through Gavi and and other organizations. So that, in fact, has been proven to be successful, and there is some talk in this space to doing something like that. And a shout out to J&J &J because you developed the only approved um, multidrug resistant mm -hmm. drug in the last few years for tuberculosis. Last few decades. Nice job. <laughs> uh, Any other questions? Sure. Oh. Oh. Uh, by, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mark Rodman from Columbia University. I appreciate the discussion on the panel today and teasing out two basic themes. One, the challenges of developing new, new, uh, new agents to be used for microbial resistance, which itself has its own challenge in how you find funding and, and how they don't become part of the problem, not the solution. But to go back to the other part that you mentioned, that is the interest in the healthcare security agenda. 
which in fact is not a national one, but an international one that has had some funding through the government with the CDC. In fact, has, well, there are scores of countries that are part of it. So I want to go turn the question about a little bit different. There are multi parts of that health security agenda and clearly responsive to the threats of infectious diseases all over the country because these things have no borders. So in that regard, taking the components of the agenda, are there business models that can be thought of or created that can help further part of the issues that are laid out in the agenda, such as predominantly better surveillance of new models of resistance all over the country, and as Mark, as you mentioned earlier, the appropriate use of antibiotics, not just by people in ICUs, which are often challenged because you may have pathogen identification, but you don't have resistance, so you use all the antibiotics sooner, but going back to the primary care. So both of those, surveillance and appropriate use, are problems, and is there a business solution that can be used to be able to attract those? Well, certainly the AMR has called for improving our ability to surveil globally, um, uh, which is not in and of itself an insignificant resource allocation in many parts of the world where they don't have this infrastructure today. Um, there's no, no question that that would help, not just for bacterial, but in other sort of threats of, of a microbial nature that move much more quickly sometimes than resistant bacteria do, that that would be very helpful. Um, I'm not sure on the second part of it um, really how that would, I guess my orientation, and I recognize, you know, if, if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, uh, and I think about this in terms of how do I attract capital. I don't know how you attract capital in, in, the, in this model. That's the, what we need is capital so that we can develop a broader array of pharmacophores, et cetera, approaches to deal with these problems. It's just not happening today for the reasons we've discussed. That's tough. I think it goes back to what we were discussing before. But by the way, I do think surveillance is getting better. So more electronic data mm -hmm. is not where it should be. But uh, FDA um, with CDC has invested a lot in things like this, approaches like the Sentinel Network, which um, you know, provides a foundation for tracking utilization and, and potentially tracking things like resistance. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's getting better in the U.S. and, and you know, clearly very important. Um, I do think that some of the changes we talked about earlier that move more towards paying not for an antibiotic when you use it, right. but paying for the real goal here, which is containing resistant infections, um, would help reinforce that. If you think about it, you know, if, the, if the company's not being paid for using a drug more, that's going to help align better with things like um, you know, hospital appropriate use programs, which Medicare now requires. but. You know, I'm not quite sure how impactful they've been. It align with some of these efforts that CDC is undertaking to track antimicrobials because if you're being paid on the basis of showing that they, they, these uh, um, uh, resistant infections aren't spreading, you've got a nice financial alignment. Um, we, we just are paying in the exact opposite way to do that right now. Yeah, we're uh, out of time, and so we need to take a, our coffee break. But, uh, um, well, we can maybe one quick question, and then I want to thank the panel. My name is Leif Pagrotsky. I'm the Consul General of Sweden in New York. In my previous life, a long time ago, I was Minister for Education and Research in Sweden, and I was very active in trying to forge a European cooperation in pooling the resources to address common European or global problems. This is a truly global issue. I couldn't hear anything that the EU and Europe is doing. Is, are they doing nothing? Could they do something? They are actually doing The regulatory fields, the legal fields, incentive fields, scientific research. Just, uh, I'm very curious. Mike, is Europe a failure? A quick response to that. Certainly as well. But, but IMI, for example, it was, was initiated, I don't know, five or six years ago, which is a public-private partnership between the EMEA uh, and industry to try and provide both funding and intellectual property um, to increase the range of sort of core um, pharmacophores that we have available for bacterial infections and so forth. And in fact, I would argue that that effort really was in front of what's been going on in the, on this side of the pond. 
Marie, any comment? C certainly. I mean, that's why I interjected the, the comment about the, the, the rest of the world participation. Europeans have led the way in many of the basic research. You have fabulous, fabulous researchers that have been working on microbial resistance for many, many years. And you have the model of EDCTP, which is the, the you know, platform for many, many ways. You funded this throughout the world in which we're doing a lot of the clinical trials. So uh, certainly Europe, Europeans and, and other parts of the world as well have been ahead of the curve on many of these issues. Subsequent to the AMR report, um, the UK has committed $80 million to basic research in this area. China has committed, I think, $140 million. Japan has committed $120 million. So we're beginning to – I think there is an emerging model where if we can get some reimbursement reform, as Mark suggests, in the developed world, and we can offset the cost of capital by these accessing these public funds to help deal with the cost of development, um, you can create a model where you can convince a capitalist, I can get you a fair return and do a public good here. I think that's possible. I think as all these pieces come together, it's just going to look a lot different in this space than it will for most life sciences innovation. So I'm going to have to wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank the panel. Would everybody join me? In, uh... So there's a coffee break until 1045, and then Mikhail Dolston's panel will begin then. Thank you, everybody.